Detroit last week when I was flying out, it was 15 degrees. Oh, so right. definitely beautiful here. So welcome, welcome everybody online. Um, I want to remind everybody, um, we're going to have some information in the uh, newsletter, but on uh, February 15th is going to be the, the business conference that we're going to do. It's all web, it's during, on the web, and we're going to be hosting it here at the center. So it's, um, it's Monday through Thursday at the kickoff um, celebration concert. They usually have concerts in the evening, so if you're available to come to the concert, that's great. We're going to be hosting it here on our new screen. It's going to look beautiful with the sound system and everything. And then, um, and then there's classes during the day, um, so if you want to uh, participate, just um, show up here. and We'll have it showing uh, Monday through Thursday. Uh, the other thing I want to just um, would let it, want to let everybody know that um, you know, as we're moving into January and Hopefully people are looking forward, right? So we're, we're looking, letting that rearview mirror of 2020 let it behind us and, and planning this next year and what we're wanting to do and how we want to experience and express life. And the reason why I bring that up is because I've been playing around with my vacations all morning long and I actually got here late. So um, looking forward to, um, you know, planning some trips and taking some trips and having some fun. And so I'm just um, inviting you to do the same, right? We're moving forward in, in 2021 and so um, the way we get back to life back to normal is we start envisioning that life is back to normal. So that's what we can do. So uh, if you will, will allow yourself to get comfortable in your space, and we're going to just open ourselves up with a centering song and, and uh, Reverend Karen's beautiful message. Thank you.
here right now as we sit as we dwell in that quiet still place I know that as we open our hearts our minds our very soul to the activity of spirit of this day that this day reflects the beauty in the mind of God I know that as we move forward today that there is that sense of oneness of connection of understanding the truth of who we are and Everything that happens today touches us, lifts us, moves us, shifts us to a new way of being and a new way of seeing so that we, in this moment, see the beauty of the divine. And as we look forward, we see it in every aspect of our life. I know that Reverend, Karen, Reverend Karen's message today is a beautiful message inspired by spirit for, she, for her heart and mind are wide open and give us a message that moves us that Celia, her music as always is exquisite and lifts us. So I know that as we go forward, it is already done. And so it is. My reading is from A New Design for Living. And it is a section called Affirmation and Denial. By far the larger part of our thinking processes are automatic, casting, as it were, the images of our acceptance into the universal law of mind, which reacts upon them. And thus, it is that, excuse me, it, and thus it is that fear can bring about the condition feared while faith can reverse it. In spiritual mind treatment, affirmation and denial, is for the purpose of erasing the wrong thought patterns and establishing correct ones. This practice is both scientific and effective in that a denial tends to erase the negative condition while an opposite affirmation tends to establish a new thought pattern which then works automatically as the negative one did. This affirmation can either instantly or gradually establish an inward recognition which becomes permanent. The whole theory of affirmation and denial in spiritual mind treatment is built upon the understanding that the law of mind itself accepts the meaning and feeling of the words which we utter as they were true. The law is like a mirror, therefore treatment must begin and bring out evidence that causes our whole inward being to accept the affirmation which we make of good. If you practice this method and watch the results of this simple process, you will discover that an idea logically presented to law will always produce a definite result. So take a moment and just allow that activity of spirit to move through you. And so it is. Hi, Hi. Yay. Hello. Yay. I was saying earlier that I haven't performed in front of live human beings <laughs> in quite a while. So, hi, hi. Oh, so cool. I just, I just need to take this in because I don't know when I'll get a chance again. <laughs> Are you happy? Are you ready to have a good day? Yeah. All right. Hi. Well, I'm going to play a little pink ukulele so you can't not be happy. <laughs> Those are the rules. <laughs> I think this song is called The Best Day of My Life. I forget what I call it. Today is gonna be a good day. It's gonna be a great day. It's gonna be the best day of my life. It's gonna be a good day. It's gonna be a great day. It's gonna be the best day of my life so far. Raging rapids of good intentions I dropped my oar and let my raft flow down the street Set my boundary for bounty Drop comparisons and counting 
Now he's a racer on my face and all I can be is free, so free, free to be me with you and you with me, so free, blissfully, free to be everything I can you to be, so free, it's gonna be a good day. upstairs kind of <laughs> her studio is upstairs so it's like really a treat having Celia in the house can you imagine I'm doing my work and there's drum beat going on and pretty soon she's rocking out to her stuff honestly what a great way to start the morning beautiful beautiful setting and by the way you just gave the entire talk way easier than what I'm gonna try and do with what I would like to say today so good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello, everyone in the distant corners of the world and those of you watching online. And we have um, some information to share today. Let me grab my eyes that I left over here. Okay, everything's all right now. I actually came out this morning without the talk. Did you notice I dived back as soon as Clyde stood here? I went, oh, no. <laughs> I need the message. So I am Reverend Karen Rice, and most of you know that. And the title that I'm speaking on today, to fit in with the, the CSL theme, the world ministers worldwide are talking uh, all year on this theme of timeless wisdom and evolutionary vision. And what a rich, gorgeous uh, theme with so much possibility for us to piggyback on. And the title of the message that I've chosen for this morning is Above All Else. Above all else, I mean, it immediately gives me this essence of how when I think of the above and I lift my head to that Godward gaze, how that feels like an opening, even in your chest, it's like you can breathe, you know, these really deep, full breaths and, and experience life in that, in that visceral sort of way. But um, Holmes is using this statement in a slightly different way, so let me just read you the quote where we're starting from. Um, we must never look outside ourselves to find God. Good, it's really good advice. Don't look outside yourself to find God because spirit is indwelling. What we are really doing is to look within our own consciousness and above all else, we must be careful not to get caught in the negative stream of consciousness. 
And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. Sue really kind of gave you the whole, the whole message in a nutshell there. But we're talking about this energetic of, of negativity and the way in which we uh, want to pay attention to what's moving in our own mind. Because if we're thinking about it, our body is, my beautiful tambourine playing friend always reminds me, your body is eavesdropping on that. That's an old Deepak Chopra statement. You know, what you're thinking about, all the cells of your body are listening. And so we want to be a little more conscious, awake, and participating in our own well-being. So what I'm going to speak about today covers three things, three parts of, of science, science of mind principles that I wanted to look at. And, and actually, I think it's really summed up in that uh, affirmation and denial. I hadn't really thought about that till you did the reading. And what page was that on? Can you look that up and tell us? The appendix of New Design for Living. Oh, it's in the appendix of a new design for living, probably under affirmation and affirmation, denial. Affirmation okay. and denial, page 249. Page 249 in um, a new design for living, which I don't really have to keep telling you. It's one of my favorite Holmes books, but it is. Um, so the three things I want to focus on this morning are, are A, that from that quote, he says, to find God, we have to look inside. Right? So to, for too long a time period, um, uh, religious people have been looking out there, and religions have been the, the fingers pointing toward it, but it's, it, it, we're now moving. I think all the changes we've seen in religion and spirituality, as spirituality is be becoming more appealing, and religion is, is shifting and changing to meet the needs of the people. Um, and boy, didn't the pandemic help us figure out some ways we had to shift and change. Um, but we want to look within. And the second point is that while you're doing that looking within, you know, and you're checking your own consciousness, you want to find out what's going on in your own mind so that we can begin to, uh, again, practice in, in, in greater ways how we can direct our own thoughts. And then finally, we want to look at that idea of above all else. Above all else, be careful that you don't get caught up in that stream of negativity. And what's useful about looking at the way he's worded that there is that he is acknowledging that there's other people's thinking that's, that, that, that kind of bombards us too. And he often referred to that as the uh, race consciousness, meaning the human race. And we also call it the collective consciousness. So there's an energy that's created in our environment by the think every what everybody's thinking. It's actually one of the reasons why being in community, even those listening from their homes that aren't sitting in the sanctuary, there is something that we create at a vibrational level that's uplifting because we're two or more gathered. We're pulling together more and more of our consciousnesses and um, and 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 pulling things in there. So. He's speaking about that collective consciousness, and we often bump into it, and you, and you can be um, confused and think that those are your thoughts, and sometimes it just helps me to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, that is not what I believe, that is not what I want to be thinking about right now, and that then gives me the real strong way to, to uh, change gears and move in a different thought pattern. He also then went on to state we must know that the all-powerful spirit is ever available and it is ever equal to healing any discordance in our lives, any discordant condition of body, mind, or affairs. So, so whatever is going on physically, and we can certainly relate to that with this uh, pandemic condition lingering and frustrating us and, you know, like, come on, let's be done with it already. And it really does look like we're heading in a good direction between the numbers falling and, the, um, and people, more and more people I know are reporting that they've already been able to get their um, vaccine. Yeah. So, so I think we can begin to now start just on those facts. We should begin to start doing as Reverend Clyde so powerfully stated, we have to start envisioning it. We have to start seeing it different. And it's difficult because that's like the first thing you hear on the news almost every night if you watch the news. Um, so Holmes is saying there, just remember there's a spirit that's bigger than we are. It's ever available and it is equal. It is actually greater than um, 
um, any discordance that we could experience in terms of our physical well-being, in terms of the kinds of thoughts that are moving to your, through your mind, or any of our own affairs or situations, the conditions in our, that we're having, experiencing in our lives, but also the affairs of the world. And I really feel like that's an important place for us to come back to visit that thought, that this is a power that's greater than any discordance. And as we remember that, we are part of now envisioning what it is that we do desire to experience. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody just got a little piece of that and started putting that in their morning practice? You know, we just kind of spread that as a contagion. It would make the turnaround much more quick. So as we're looking at trying to digest all of this and understand it so we can apply it in our everyday living, what I recognize is we have to begin by that idea of, of that, that theme of the indwelling presence. We have to begin at the beginning and, and revisit uh, our own idea of what God is, so how we, how we define God. And what I believe is that the way I define God right now in my life is real different than I used to define God as a much younger woman. But what I also know is that that... Um, my own definition of what the divine is and what that word God means to me will continue to shift and change as I grow a more intimate relationship with that divine aspect of life, that which I call God. I love that. You know, I, I have a real intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and I'm quite comfortable with it, but I know that it will continue to deepen because that's what happens. That's the way we... Um, uh, have our own um, um, timeless wisdom and evolutionary vision. Our own vision, no matter how enlightened you are, can always continue to expand and grow or deepen in whatever ways you want to use the languaging around that. <clears throat> but the truth is, there are so many of us that um, have an immediate reaction to that word, God that we have experiences from our past that impact us, but we are also impacted with the, that collective consciousness, what, what everybody else in the world believes God, about God and how they define it too. So um, the, probably the majority of people, at least in the Western world, began with an idea somewhere it was planted in our our belief system whether our parents raised us religiously or not we all have this idea that god is some sort of a super being that god is um uh, someone that may or or some entity that may or may not grant our wishes that god is this thing that's always sort of spying on us and that if he gets uh, annoyed that, that he might throw an occasional thunderbolt down to make a point, right? And so though these are, are sort of childlike ideas, they're so deeply ingrained in the, in, the, you know, in the belief system of so many people that as humankind began to wake up, especially at the, at the end of that last century there, people were waking up like crazy and consequently religious um, um, places of worship, attendance started to fall, and, and the people that used to sit in the pews began to say things like, but, but how could we have the only true religion? You know, and how come gay people aren't welcome here? And how come, um, you know, and then the list goes on and on and on. Be people began to see that religion was, had some, some corners that were kind of limiting. And so it was a great wake-up call for all of the churches to figure out how to do things slightly differently. But meanwhile, we're carrying around these beliefs that may not even be ours. And what, what really sort of hum is humorous to me is that I think even atheists, if you ask an atheist why they don't believe in God, they will describe the God I just described. Well, because how could I believe in uh, something? Somebody's up there on a cloud making weird little puppets and... Um, who, is it, who is it, Bill Maher, that, that's such an atheist and outspoken yeah. against religion? He's so clever in the way he reports news, but man, that guy is really doesn't like the idea of God or church or anything. And I think that represents what I see when I talk to atheists. And yet, we have had 
atheists here and agnostics who aren't as uncomfortable here as they would be in other church environments. Um, so what I know is that um, the God that the atheist doesn't believe in, I don't believe in either, and that's not the kind of uh, divine being that created the, uh, the universe that we talk about in, in this particular teaching. So um, there is some kind of an a, a old-fashioned um, image that lingers, and I notice that when I have conversations with people and they don't like that idea of God, it, it's so often something they're, um, they, they haven't real. you can heal that. You know, you can heal that. You can get over that. And I believe that the education that's offered in any New Thought Church is the beginning of doing that. So you may come here a recovering Catholic, but my, my heart would want you to heal that so you can love the, and treasure the richness of your, your family heritage, if that was your family religion, right? Or if you're Jewish, you know, we should still carry some of those traditions and rituals into our lives so that we can have that um, experience and connection even to our ancestors. Sometimes I think of my, my Russian grandma, gra grandma's grandma's grandma, you know, and I get all the way back to who is it, Yaga, Yaga Baba, or, you know, Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga, yeah? Thank you. It's good to have a goddess in the house. They know these things. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, that is really exciting. And that really inspires me to want to continue helping people expand their idea of what God is so we can get God out of the box and, and that I can say it without worrying uh, about um, um, stumbling somebody, which I don't really worry about. I, I just speak. But you know who's done probably the one of the, the people that has contributed the most to us being able to redefine that image in our mind of God? I think the guy that has done that is Neil Donald Walsh. You know, he's the guy that wrote all the Conversations with God books. And, you know, it's, he, he's written more than 10 of those Conversation with God books. But I, I researched this. And in addition to that, he's written about 25 other books, of which many are in my library, because I find it really enlightening. So for the past 10 or 12 years, he started those books in 1995. But for the past 10 or 12 or 15 years, um, in, in addition to that, he's been writing books like uh, a Tomorrow's God, and he speaks about a new spirituality being born on the planet, and all of that really aligns to the same message that I've been intuiting for quite some time, and that is that something new, spiritually speaking, is emerging on the planet right now, and it looks like chaos, but you watch and see what comes of it, you know, or if we're still around when we actually figure out what came from it. Some of us, it might be our kids that benefit from it, but, but we know, um, or our grandkids probably. Um, but I have a, a great confidence, and I think that I'm immensely grateful for this quirky guy who grew up as a Catholic, and he was like many of you, I hear this a lot when I'm teaching, like many of you, he was one of those kids in catechism, and he would get the priest go, and he'd go, but why? You know, I don't understand that. And he has this great story I heard at a conference once. He tells this story of when he was eight years old that there was a new McDonald's opening in their town. And so as soon as school let out on a Friday, all the little boys and ran to the new McDonald's to get a hamburger. And he's eating his hamburger. It's so exciting because they're trying out McDonald's. And he realizes he's just sinned because he ate meat on a Friday. And he has this traumatic experience. And he goes to the priest and he goes, am I going to hell? And, and then the priest says, no, well, no, not exactly. But, you know, there's this purgatory thing. And he tries to explain it to him. And as, an, as a small boy, he recognized that, no, I, I just don't think I agree with the priest, you know. And there are a lot of us that had those intuitions that we didn't fit in with some of the stuff that was told us um, in, in terms of all that spiritual um, um, dogma, the dogma that goes along with all of that. So... Um, Neil Donald Walsh was on Larry King. <laughs> Can you imagine? That just makes me <laughs> chuckle when I think about it. Because Larry King, if you don't remember Larry King, late night TV, always the devil's advocate. It probably didn't matter what you were coming to talk about in, in the interview. 
Um, he played the devil's advocate, but in this case, it was God and the devil, I think. <laughs> and um, when I looked up Neil Donald Walsh, because I wanted to just remind you who he was and get, you know educate my get, get some fun facts for me, what I saw was that they quoted what Walsh said, how he described himself to Larry King on the Larry King show. That's how they told you who he was. They quoted the Larry King show. It made me laugh. So he described it this way to Larry King. He said, I was on a very low point in my life. This is um, his explanation of how the conversation with God began. He says, I was at a, a really low point in my life, and I was really angry at God. I was angry at God. And so I started writing God a very angry letter, and it was filled with questions. If you're so great, why does this happen? And I don't understand. This makes no sense at all. And he's writing all these questions. He's just kind of purging it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I love this part. He heard a voice behind him from the, on the right side. And he turned around. And of course, nobody was there. And the voice said this. Do you really want to know the answer to all these questions? Or are you just venting? <laughs> so in that instant he realized that he had answers to those questions and he needed to just start writing them down so he does not people get confused he did not ever claim that he was channeling god i mean he kind of did in a uh in a in a in a funny way to you know but he never did that as like a, a great authority they had this relationship he always did this because he recognized that there was some kind of indwelling wisdom in him that did have those answers. That he wasn't going to get them from a priest. He wasn't going to get them from a physicist or a, you know, anybody that was brilliant. Or a, uh, he, he, he just wrote down everything that came to him. And it began this beautiful, uh, long series of conversations that became books that um, we now know and love. And the reason I tell you all that is... Well, there are two things. One, one is I want to read you a quote, but first I want to say this. When I hear that story, he reminds me of me in the way that I am always telling you that when life looks confusing to me and I get in a quandary about what the, what the hell's going on? Why is that happening? That I recognize that as a way I sort of stamp my foot or draw my line in the sand and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I open myself and I really open myself to the higher guidance. And I will say, um, uh, okay, this doesn't make sense to me. There has to be another way of seeing this. Lord, show me that way because I sure don't get it right now. So it's about opening. Can you see how that's a prayer request? So in that same way, his writing an angry letter was this major prayer request that summoned a response. Now, this is so science of mind, and, and now we're going to get into the denials and the affirmations, but let me tell you why I looked into him to begin with. I found this quote, and this is just such a beautiful quote that speaks it. It kind of sums up everything I've said so far. God is not a singular super being, but the extraordinary process of life. God is not a singular super being, but this extraordinary process of life. Now, New Thought has been saying it for a hundred plus years, but all the great thinkers through the ages the mystics, the sages, have had the same intuition. You know, when you sit and you, and you ponder and you, you're contemplative you, and you look at these rich things, you begin to see that there's wisdom in you that first just sounds like, I don't, I don't get that. And then as you open yourself to higher guidance, you begin to get a different perspective. That's how spirit works in our life. And this is really useful for us to look at. Now, in this teaching, The Science of Mind, uh, founded by Dr. Ernest Holmes, whom, whom all the major quotes uh, I'm sharing today come from, we're one of those teachings. You know, we stand in this idea that, that our teaching 
is based on an idea of God that excludes no one. We know and believe and teach that, that this idea of what God is is always present in everyone and that there is a living spirit, a force for good in this universe that responds to us at our level of connection with it. Really important part. And that makes us a little different than uh, traditional religion of almost every faith. There is a, uh, a, a living spirit, that force for good that Holmes always says, and you can use it. There is that that responds to us at our level of connection with it. And so this is why almost every Sunday I stand here and I, I, I urge you, I, um, I um, guilt you even sometimes into having a spiritual practice. The value of our spiritual practice is that when we are doing anything, prayer or meditation or just sitting still without being interfering in the world in any way, we are being proactive in a way that encourages that deep personal connection with the divine. We are allowing our mind to be open to that which we call the one mind. And um, that's the only way we can really get these divine insights. It's that preparatory work we do. I think Jesus of Nazareth was such a perfect example because he, as the great teacher, as the great example, not an exception, he was showing us, he's the, I like to call him the elder brother because that gives me a little more uh, sense of, of connection to Jesus and the teaching. He was able to do this. He was able to intuit that indwelling presence, which was really different for the Jewish faith. And he was a Jewish rabbi. And so they still had this one God that was away and separate. And he had this amazing, what, what a great soul he was. He has amazing intuition to know that, that no, it's, there's more to it than this. And that was his message. That was his ministry. So Jesus found God in his very own soul, and we call that the Christ consciousness. He embodied the Christ consciousness. Now, he wasn't, you know, he didn't own it. He was a human being in the same way that we are human beings, perhaps a little more enlightened than the average soul. I think we could say that. <laughs> Um, um, but he, 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 the idea of the Christ consciousness was not his. That was the people made him the Christ later. But he embodied this great wisdom, this understanding, and he owned it and claimed it, and he lived it. So um, he had this holy encounter that could change anybody's life simply by recognizing what the message is. And then, and then practicing that way to receive it or to be open to it or, or to, uh, to allow it to express through us in the way that Jesus allowed it to express through him. So we can do that. He was this example. He was the, the way shower that said, this is possible. This is valuable. This could change everything if we begin to understand that. Now, here's how Holmes would say all of that. He said, and he did say this. Jesus realized that God is personal to all who are receptive to this divine influx. Wow, I like that term, divine influx. I just say that and like, oh, something fires up inside of me. I can feel it kind of like right in this area here. It must be solar plexus. You know, what does that mean? Somebody tell me quickly. What does it mean when you feel it right there? Well, you can tell me later. <laughs> Um, so the message of the Christ consciousness is the only thing that we need for a greater sense of freedom in our lives, for a greater sense of moving through our life without feeling so limited, even in a pandemic, the only thing we need is nothing more than a greater realization of what we already are. We got it. We got it. And we want to own it. And we want to uh, remain open to know that it's this live force, this great, beautiful force of spirit that desires to express through us and in our life as us. See, 
something inside you knows that same stuff that Jesus knew. Jesus knew that he was the beloved of the, of the Father. You know, Jesus, Jesus knew, he recognized something. He talked to the divine, and he called, he called the divine God, and he called it Heavenly Father. And he brings us this sweet way that when you look at the translations, when he would say Abba, Abba is like Papa. It's a really tender form. So we can learn through Jesus that there's a way we can have an intimacy with that which created us and that which created all of, of, of life, everything in the universe. And the reason this is important is because if we know that and open ourselves to it, then the next step is to remember those words of Holmes. And above all uh, else, above all else, do not get caught up in that negative stream of consciousness. So that's such good advice. Uh, you know, I was thinking, I've been, um, through the years, I've been accused of um, not believing in evil, which, which totally makes me laugh. I don't know how I give this message. And then somebody hears and they think I'm Pollyanna and they think I don't think there's bad stuff in the world and that there aren't evil things, you know. Uh, and, and, and what I realized as I was pondering that is that I healed my relationship with evil, not through the science of mind. It wasn't through uh, any definition that Holmes gave me. It was because I was a fundamental Christian and I loved being that. I loved all my Goodness, I was passionate and oh, expansive, and it was wonderful until it wasn't. And it was like one day I woke up and I recognized how much fear I carried around in my body. And sadly, I had learned enough to realize that it wasn't a fear of God. It was that I had so much fear in what could happen to me because Satan the devil wanted my soul so bad, was just luring me in at every moment and that I had to be on guard all the time. And what happened for me was that I realized I had so much faith that that was true, that I had more faith in the devil than I did in God. Right? In the way I was living my life, I was walking around. If I had had more faith in God, that fear would not have been such a burden for me to carry around. And that was when I woke up and said, okay, you need to reconsider how you believe. What, what do you really believe? And honestly, I did have to throw out the devil. I had to evict him. It was just, I tried all kinds of things, and it just, it, so, so in a way, I guess, you could be frustrated with me, because I did have the courage to evict the, the devil, and may I just tell you, my life changed in huge ways almost immediately. It was just so cool to have that experience. But I want to read you um, the definition of evil from Dr. Ernest Holmes. I just decided to do this this morning. Um, Holmes says that this is what evil is. So, see, if I asked if I asked a group of people, we'd all have a different definition. That's what I know. You know, if I asked you, if I asked people that are spiritual intellectualists, like we kind of tend to be in this teaching, we like to, you know, look up things and and know stuff. We would easily answer, well, evil is just the absence of good or the uh, 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 the absence of light. But if I asked a, a, a religious traditionalist, you know, the, what, what, how would you, what makes you, what do you think of when I say evil? They would immediately talk about Satan, the devil, and the, all the dark, bad things are happening on the planet because of, of the work of the evil one. And that, I mean, we even, um, well, never mind. Keep this. Focus, Karen. Focus. <laughs> and then I and then I thought, well, if you, we talked about evil in the month of January in this country, we might just say insurrection. We all watched it. We saw it. Except me, I didn't. But but it, it, that there was a lot of evil there. So what the bottom line is, we we see that what we believe about evil is, if we're if we're really honest, 
We're just naming evil to be the opposite of whatever we think good is. And so, of course, there are, are lots of ways to look at that. But here's what Holmes says about evil. And this is a good metaphysical or new thought definition of evil. Evil is that which seems destructive. It's an experience of the soul on its journey toward the realization of reality. Well, that almost sounds like, you know, can you see the gift in the, you know, and, and we know that at some level, we know that our mistakes have always been the things that, re, that helped us correct our course, you know, but that um, um, it's a journey, it's an experience of the soul on this journey toward a greater reality and evil will remain a problem as long as we believe in it of itself, however, it is neither person, place, or thing, and it'll disappear to the exact proportion that we cease in our destructive methods. And then he goes on to talk about how, you know, like you make a mistake and there's, there's a consequence to that, right? You, if, you, uh, if, tr if you trip and fall, you're going to, at the very least, probably get bruised, right? There's, it's just life. It's just cause and effect is what he's saying. So um, Holmes uh, wrote this beautiful quote. This is what I based the, the uh, this is what excited me about writing the talk. This particular quote is probably the important one of this morning. Um, but he said this, he puts a twist on it, and I teased about it in my writing for the, in the newsletter. But he says, it's better to affirm the presence of good, I uh, know of God, it's better to affirm the presence of God than it is to deny the presence of evil. However, if the presence of evil persists in making its appearance in our minds, in the way we are interpreting what we think we're seeing, if it persists in your mind, that negative stream of consciousness he's talking about, um, it, then in that case, it may be well to deny it, to know it is neither person, place, or thing, and that it does not belong to you. It does not have to stay there. That, you know, that, that we're going to remove it. So now, here's where we get into, this is why it hurt your reading, Sue, was so beautiful. Um, it's that the term denial is defined not as um, um, just denying that it's real. We don't deny that it's real. And so when we use that term deny, it, it, it's kind of tricky because it has a very specific metaphysical definition that's been, it's hundreds of years old. I don't know, maybe it even goes back to, the philosophers, um, which would be thousands of years. Um, um, but we see that now we're, we're talking about, you know, in this quote he's saying, we all have equal access to God. We all have equal access to good. Um, but there are, are always going to be those who don't show up in life in the way that we define good. So we are always going to witness, um, you know, because it's that whole free will thing, choice. We all make our own choices. And so people will have, make different choices and they will look in different depending on what you think is good. And there will always be people who are, uh, just refuse to align to anything good. There are people that are not very good at being compassionate. There are people that probably don't even know how to be kind. And, and it's helpful if we remember that that is not an entity that is trying to get you. Yes, horrible things happen. I watched that Netflix. I'm sorry I did. That Netflix on the Night Stalker because we lived in the San Gabriel Valley in that, at that time. And that was scary stuff. So we watched a couple episodes because my kids said, oh, my God, it's our neighborhood. You have to check it out. And they, we were really truly scared. Everybody was. But, but so that happens, but that's a, that's a rare thing. And, and, and the best thing we can do in situations like that is to, to face the fear, to look at the discord, and then to be vigilant in aligning ourselves to good, in doing the prayers that we know to do, and to putting ourselves in a different stream of consciousness than the negativity. And it is really hard sometimes. That's why you talk about it every single week. So, um, so, so we all have choice, and then there's all, and we all have consequences. So, um, at some point, we're invited to. I think it takes great 
uh, experience and maybe spiritual maturity or life maturity um, to recognize that people that, that do bad things are probably doing the best they can to get the kind of things that all of us want, the same sense of peace, the same sense of freedom, the same sense of joy, but they don't have the tools to go about getting it. So it, when I think about it that way, it helps me see, as the Course in Miracles would say, it's a call for love. And, you know, the, the really bad people aren't very lovable, right? And so, you know, our job is not to accept the behavior, but to know that there too is a child of God. There too is a person that desires to experience good and well-being in their lives. And they, they you know, they don't have, they, you know, and, and pray for their well-being. So when Holmes said, it's better to affirm the presence than to deny the presence, this is where Sue gave a better explanation than I'm about to try to do. We don't pretend that bad things don't happen, but we remind ourselves that it's not personal. We get our, per, the personal stuff out of the way. And the definition of denial says um, it's the mental act of knowing that any negative condition can be cleared away. That denial, it said so much better your way, Sue, but denial clears the way for a realization of truth because it, it wipes out all the wrong um, reasoning. It, it takes that away. It's like, Holmes says, it's like it dredges the channels of our mind. It gets that negativity all the way out of there so that we can deny the false and then we can affirm the real. I was thinking about when the virus first hit, the coronavirus came and we had to shut down the church and and we're all looking at each other, don't not knowing. I mean, there were so many unanswered questions. Remember, we weren't even wearing masks yet then. There was so much we didn't know. And I was thinking about how really what a what a heaviness that was for me to carry around. I, just because I'm a minister doesn't mean I don't feel it. I do. And then I did this brilliant thing. I opened myself to get more educated about it. And I found very early on a broadcast of some sort, a podcast or a video or something on the internet that Greg Braden did, like right, right off in the beginning. And I'm so happy I saw that because Greg Braden, whom I respect, and he's, he's a scientist, but he's deeply spiritual. And he said that we have to remember the, the first thing that will help us to minimize our fear so that we can boost our immune system you gotta, you got to dredge the channels of fear in your mind. And the first thing we need to do is look at the virus as it's not like a living thing that's out to get you. It's a ball of protein, and we bump into it, and it interrupts the, the, the health of certain individuals, and we have an experience of, of, of having the virus. You know? And he said, you've you got to think about it, that it's not out to get you. It's not like it's, uh, uh, it's alive and it's looking for a host, it, and that's how it acts, and that's how I hear some scientists talking about it. But I'm telling you, that, that dredged the channels of my mind in such a way that it gave me the courage to come and speak to you on Sunday mornings through a camera, right? And to, and to move through all the difficulties we had in setting up a, a proper way to communicate with everybody. So think of that as another way of saying, okay, this isn't working for me. All of this is scary. The, the stuff in the news, this isn't working for me. So Lord, show me another way of looking at it. Show me how to, 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 to clear the, the stream of consciousness so there is no negativity in it, so that I can step into the affirmations and really embody that Christ consciousness this universal truth that will um, support me through whatever, whatever conditions we live through. Above all else, we want to put a, a, a stop to the, the negative stream of thinking. And so I will leave you with this this morning. Every time you stop and you say, okay, God, 
Okay, infinite intelligence of all the universe, you got to give me a slightly different perspective or shine some light on this from a different angle because I'm not getting it. We open ourselves and every time you do that, you have met your own edge of growth. And when you meet your edge of growth and you open yourself to take in a little bit more information, divine information, have a personal encounter with spirit, what happens is you expand your consciousness. And so as we do that, we are indeed helping to heal the world. That's what I wanted to say this morning. So I want to pray on it. As always, I just love how the words of prayer can anchor ideas. So get comfortable right where you're seated. And begin to just relax into the space wherever you are. You're here, you're at home, you're sitting at your office at work, listening later. Just begin to, to know that there has been something spoken this morning. And it's a beautiful truth. And it's in a frame with your name on it. And so at this time, we just open our hearts and our minds so that we can be that which will receive that truth. I feel the love of God in this room. I recognize that right where we are is the fullness of the Holy Spirit itself. It is that infinite intelligence of all the universe. It is God. It is wisdom. It is peace. It is joy. And most of all, it is love. And so we just recognize that movement of love at the core of our being. I feel that love. And it quickens within me to allow me to expand even more to be even more clear that right here, right now, is that presence within us, that gorgeous influx of divinity. And so we feel that and we allow it to be the, the energy that charges us, that recharges us, that reinvigorates us and it up, up, uplifts us and inspires us so that we are, are functioning at that very beautiful high level of truth and we are easily able to meet all of the activities required of us this week. I feel that love of God and I know that it is that, that healing uh, call, that desire of life to express through each and every one of us so that there is a revealing of something that is whole and complete and perfect. And I know that it outpictures as our, our vibrant health, our well-being. And that as that is true for ourselves, it is true for all of our loved ones. And so we stand in this place of, of revisiting again that beautiful truth that yes, indeed, each and every one of us has equal access to the grace of God. And so this is the time that we open ourselves and we just imagine that we are containers that are here this morning that are sharing these words of prayer that we might be filled with that grace, that we might recognize from the, the very deepest part of our soul that it is the Father's good pleasure to to pour that grace into our lives. And so I, I feel that sense of divine fullness, that completeness, that perfection, that which heals by way of that divine light and illumination, anything that ails us or that worries us or that weighs on us. And in that healing and that wholeness, we, are, we, we, we sense the lifting that we are moving as if we are, 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 are walking off the ground because there's that lightness, there's that attraction, there's that Godward gaze that 
holds us and carries us. And I see again that in this state, in this mental truth connected to this one mind, that we are indeed held sweetly in the hands of God, that we are indeed the beloved of the Creator. And so I know that nothing can interfere with that flow of good into our lives and that we are prepared mentally and physically and we are able and our souls are ready to receive our good. And I know this is true for each of us as individuals and for our families and for our loved ones. And it is true for this spiritual community. So I say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, life. Thank you, infinite spirit. How wonderful it is to know that this indwelling presence is always here as a beautiful force for good and not off on a cloud somewhere. And so as we close this morning and this prayer, we simply release all of the desires of our hearts, all of the words spoken into the law and know indeed that it has received, it has activated, and it is already done. And together we say, and so it is. Amen. Amen. So I am doing an online concert if you're interested. It's a healing concert on Tuesday night, 6 p.m. our time to celebrate um, Imbolc and Bridget, goddess Bridget, who's a healing goddess. So if you're interested, come find me online. Ah, let's sing. And the breath falls into the body. And the thoughts fall out of the mind And the ancient ones come to heal us Beyond all space and time Beyond
if I would stand up here and say, now is the time that we recognize our lack and limitation. <laughs> but instead, every Sunday I say, now is the time that we recognize the abundance of our community as well as each and every person's abundance, right? We focus on that, we pay attention to the abundance. And because of that, we have our building painted, we have all kinds of beautiful things that happened over this last year, um, even though we were going through this COVID experience. So. That's why we recognize the abundance of the universe as well as the abundance in our life and in our community. So now, if we can say our giving affirmation together, uh, so if you can repeat after me, I live in a consciousness of good, divine love blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, and so it is. It's me, isn't it? <laughs> oh, wait. this would be better not to have it in all the mask on. All right, so I just have a quick announcement. I want to remind you, we are having our family, no, 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 our annual business meeting on February 21st, and it's a part of our bylaws that we have to announce it and let you know. We do need a quorum, and we will be doing it, um, I think, on Zoom. I think that... On the, that we're still, the board's actually still having discussion on it all week and, and, and on the internet. And, um, and, but we, we will have people in the building, is that right? So if you're here on that Sunday, you can just stay for the meeting. And then we can count you, which would be great, because we, we haven't done a business meeting with the whole congregation on Zoom, and I'm concerned because I, not everybody has access to Zoom. So spread the word, um, and we have one board position available. So if you have any interest whatsoever, now's the time to fill out an application. I've already received one, and, um, and, and, and I need to announce that as well. So you can, um, if, if that's your divine call, then, then the board will look at the you know, choosing. So um, have a blessed week. I think we will close now with um, our Eddie Watkins, Jr., Rapidly becoming one of my favorites. You want to stand? Oh, yes. Stand. Bear the burdens that sometimes come living this thing called life. Am I wise enough to make the right decisions when I stand in that road? Sometimes I wonder and ponder only to realize. I'm not alone and there's nothing I have to do on my own because I am the place where God is.
a man and body to live a life of grace and holiness. Sometimes I Please. 